chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey, in the hood, we got this saying, ain't no life tougher than living in the hood forever. I used to laugh at that saying, and in some way, I still do, you know? I ain't gonna lie, though, man. Growing up in the hood and being a full-grown adult, you know, being put back in the hood, two different things. You know, as a kid, you really ain't got no choice to change the situation you in. You just had to roll with it because that's where your folks were. And that's where you were too. So you just kept rolling with the punches until you find a way out the hole, right? You know, move on, get a better life, or, or you die trying. But being a grown man, getting out, and still ending up in the hood, man, that's a whole nother story. That's when you know life just pimped you out, man. Promise you a better future, but then you get backhanded, you know, back to the bottom of the food chain. Getting bent over every night and not making a single dime. That's how I feel. See, you know, I ain't never been a fan of being hood, man. You know, I always knew even back when I was just a little kid that I was destined for more. That the hood, you know, it wasn't for me. I even went as far as distancing myself from much as possible from all the gang bangers and dope boys in our area. I even had to fight some of them off after they tried to recruit me. I wasn't having none of that. I wasn't about to just die in these streets, man, like all them suckers, man. Ain't no way, man, I'm finna take a bullet to the head selling drugs or fighting for a gang I don't even believe in. Nah, man, I ain't going. So, that, you know, so these days they want to be, you know, they want to be gangsters, man. I don't know if they were, they were bloods or vice lords or something, man. They come up on me. And, uh, you know, I took it to them. Pop, 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 boop, boop, boop. I wasn't going. I put, you know, I said, I ain't going down without a fight, man. And I'm telling you, man, my heart was racing and my blood was pumping. You know, it was like an all-time high, man. I never felt that good. Man, I grabbed the leader in the headlock, man, and I, I just started just bumping, busting him in his face, man. And while the rest of his crew, you know, they just started, they just pouring out punches and kicks on me, man. It was a good six of them, including, you know, this sucker I had trapped up in my arm, man. Man, I made that fool bleed so bad, his face looked like, like the, the inside of a, a, a fresh tomato. I ain't even pay attention to the pain from the punches connecting to the back of my head and my ribs and the kicks to the legs. If I was gonna die, I was bringing one of them down with me. That what Unc taught me back in the day. He said, if you go down, you ain't jump on you, you at least take one of them with you. So that's what I did. You know, I'm just like right on the edge of passing out completely when I heard them police sirens. Man, them game bangers, man, they must have sucked their fighting, but boy, they could run like a mug, boy. The next thing I knew, I'm in the hospital. You know, I had a real bad headache, and you know, I, I wanted to feel how bad it was, but the, the cuffs on my hands didn't let me. Good, I finally awake, said the cop that was standing right beside me. I figured he was the one who brought me there too. Look, man, you know, I, I ain't want no trouble, man. I ain't no gang member or no dope head or nothing, man. I was just in the wrong place in the wrong time with the wrong people. He looked at me and said, look, kid, I'm not here to arrest you. I just, I cut him off. I said, what you talking about? You ain't arresting me. You got me handcuffed to this bed, man. 
just following protocol, kid. Now listen, like I said, I'm not arresting you, but I do want to offer you a choice, an option out of your current situation. And what exactly is this option you talking about? I asked him. The military. Man, this fool must be tripping. He thought I was about to, you know, let uh, some grown man, you know, shout at me and and all in my face and all that, man. I guess these gang members must have actually got some good shots in because I ain't said a word back. You know what? Even though I'm, it's like I'm turning down one gang and jumping in another gang. I was actually kind of thinking about it. I sat on the bed and thought about it hard. I can't believe I was actually considering this guy an offer, man. But I said, yeah. And the next day, he took me to his buddy recruiting office. And they gave me the rundown of what I could, uh, could expect once I signed up with the Army. And man, I tell you, the Army don't play. I'm talking free lodging, free food, and health, dental benefits on top of all that, education. You know, this, this thing might not be too bad, man. They even helped me relocate and all that. All of that, and all I have to do is survive a couple months of being yelled at by some angry dudes and doing what I'm told. Man, boot camp finna be a breeze. I filled out and signed all the paperwork, went home and told my folks that son about to be a man in uniform. You know, Pops, he was proud, man. But you know, Mama, Mama was kind of nervous, man. She was still supportive and all, but I could tell she wasn't really feeling it. You know, that following week, I was on a plane with a bunch of other kids that were out on their way to boot camp with me. We landed at the airport super early. And I mean, it was like zero dark 30 early. We got out and there were buses waiting for us by the gates. Two dudes in uniform started screaming at us and told us to get in formation. And when I say we look like fools, I mean, we look like ants running around when you, you know, when you drop some water on them. It took a couple minutes and a lot of screaming, but we finally got into a decent formation. They call out each of our names one by one, and we got on them buses. There was a good hundred of us and only two buses. And these fools turned, into, uh, turned us into some sardines, man, real quick. I'm talking about I was watching this other kid sweat, you know, form and drip, and then roll down from his head on down, to, you know, onto this napkin he had, man. I was way too close to this dude, man. It was super uncomfortable. The actual drive to the base only took like 20 minutes, but it felt like we were on the road for hours. Being cramped up in a bus with a boatload of strangers in the dead of the night in a city I'd never been in really had me feeling some type of way. The type of way to make you want to just, just vomit in now. I was like, I can't vomit, because if I vomit, then the next person gonna vomit, and everybody on the mud be vomiting, so I ain't gonna do it. We get to the base, and you know how they show all them cool things in the movies and TV shows, like like tanks and, and guns and other military stuff? Yeah, we ain't see none of that, G. Just, they took us uh, to the part of the base that they don't show you on the TV or in the movies. We all stepped in the bus and were put in formation again. And I realized then that this was gonna be a normal thing here. It was so quiet, man. Like so quiet, you could you could hear uh, like a fart coming before it even started. The same instructors that yelled at us at the airport yelled at us here too. Man, they were yelling so hard. You could see the spit flying and veins popping out their necks. 
Looking like they about to just, just blow up or something, man. The whole thing was a scream fest. That's all the drill sergeants ever did, man. Yell at you to do something, you know, and then yell at you for doing something, and then yell at you again for not doing something. That's all what boot camp was, man, day in, day out. There was nothing special about it. Anything and everything about it, you can Google yourself or watch videos on YouTube, so I ain't got to go in depth, but with all that, because, um, it's, it's just the usual stuff. And anyway, that's not the reason I'm sharing this. 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 Man. I don't even know what you would call this. A journal, maybe? Man, whatever, man. It's a story. It's my story. You know, and, and I'm sharing it. And actually, you know, I take that back. This story revolves around the kid, you know, this kid named Jackson, Jerome Jackson. You know, I call him Jackson because that's how it used to be in the military. You know, we did call him JJ, but you know, when it was formal time, we called him Jackson. Everybody get called by their last name. First name basis was for, was for the civilians. And by the time we got to boot camp, we weren't civilians no more. We were recruits, and that's how we were to be referred to. I was Recruit Johnson, and if by some uh, prank or fate of the universe, I was appointed bunk buddies with this kid named Jackson. You see, in boot camp, we had bunk beds, and whoever became before or after you was going to be your battle buddy. That means you're going to be your partner in crime and everything. From PT, for physical training, for those of you that don't know, to marching, and basically everything else. So that meant the drill sergeants would nine times out of ten mess with you and your battle buddy, no matter who did what wrong. It wasn't so bad, you know, just more yelling and more push-ups and squats and running and all that. You know, everybody had their turn. Everybody was stupid at one point or another. But man, <laughs> Jackson was a different kind of stupid man. Like, this boy was so dumb. You know, like, he was just dumb as a brick that don't fit. He the type of dumb that asked for blinker fluid at the auto shop. I'm talking about, man, he just can't get right. Can't get right dumb. And the funny thing is, too, Jackson looked exactly like Steve Urkel, but without the brains. He even had the same giant glasses with the strap on the back. You know, they government issued and stuff. You know, them boot camp glasses, what we call them. Everyone with bad eyesight had to wear them every day. I want to think that's even one of the reasons we got messed with most of the time by the drill sergeants. You know, they even nicknamed him Recruit Urkel because uh, he always, always asked, why drill sergeant? when he was given any order by any drill sergeant. Every time. And they freaking hated that kind of attitude, man. And you know why? That's just how it is in boot camp. That's the only way you survive. You keep your mouth shut and you do like they tell you to do. But not Big Jack, boy. Uh-uh. That dumb boy, man, he ain't know when not to talk. And when you talk back to your drill sergeant, you get punished. And guess who get punished alone with this bro? Yep, that right. Jackson and Johnson going down together, battle buddies to the end. First time he did it though, you know, it was cause he was trying to act tough and all that. Next couple times, you know, I thought this fool was messing with me and, you know, trying to break me or something. But when he kept asking and kept consistent being, you know, consistent with being stupid all the time, I realized that he really was just that dumb. At first it was kind of funny, but when it became a daily thing, I started getting PO'd, man. I could be fixing my uniform or doing laundry 
you know, during free time, when I hit a drill sergeant, saw my name. Joe's hurt! Get your sorry butt over here! Then I'm running up, yes, drill sergeant, sir. You know, I shout back and I'm running as fast as I can to wherever they were. And yep, there he was too. God dang Johnson. Or Jackson. I'm Johnson. Every single freaking time. It wasn't fair, man. You know, it ain't make no sense. I was just getting punished all because of Urkel Jr. Couldn't help but not to be stupid. The only time I ever got punished for something that I was responsible for is when I finally snapped on him. You know, it was light out and I wanted to get as much sleep as I can because we were going to be hiking the hills the next day. But Jackson just wouldn't stop talking. I'm like, he even got out of his bed and started talking to me. He was talking about how no matter how bad it got there, he pushed through it. That it was, you know, the better life. And his voice was so annoying. I just snapped, man. I shot straight up out the bed and I choked him like he owed me my money or something, man. It ain't take long before he was on the ground, you know, and I was on top. And I'm just choking up daylights out of him, man. The other recruits woke up and they broke us up. Then a drill sergeant who was in charge of us that night, uh, Sergeant Diaz, showed up. This dude was like five foot nothing, about 150 pounds, soaking wet. But he was the meanest and angriest drill sergeant we had, man. I'm talking about the guy had straight up Napoleon complex. He was the type who always enjoyed playing stupid games with us, making us do all kinds of stupid crap and then some. And that night was no different. He just stood there with this big old smile on his face and he said, you ladies look like you got some energy left in your bodies. Good. Get your stuff and meet me outside. It was 2 a.m., 2 in the freaking morning, man. Solid four hours before the original scheduled hike, and we were already up on all our gear standing out in formation, just freezing our nips off out there, man. Nobody was saying nothing, but I knew for a fact that the entire platoon wanted me to beat the living dog mess up out of Jack. And I don't blame him, man, but I do blame Jackson. Boy, the way I was feeling that morning, oh, you better stay away from me because I was going to kill him. That was the only thing going through my mind during the entire hike. I'm going to kill this fool. I'm going to kill this boy. Man, I'm going to murder this man. I had murder on my mind, boy. And I just stared at him the whole entire time just burning a hole through him with my eyes. And about an hour and a half, we got to the halfway point about six miles in, another six to go. I was about to take a sip of water when I felt somebody grab me from the back. It was Sergeant Diaz. <sighs> he grabbed me from the back of my collar and he grabbed Jackson too. And he said he had an idea to help Jackson and me get along become better brothers, he said. Before I could ask, he took our packs off our backs and threw the things off the side of the hill. Me and Jackson, you know, we looked at him and he just yelled at us. Them packs ain't gonna fetch themselves, boy. You better hurry up and get down there before the entire platoon gonna leave you behind here. So we started fumbling down the side of this hill and I'm telling you, man, it was steep than a mud, man. Steeper than a rent in New York. I'm talking about it was steep, boy. You almost had to lay down just so you don't fall straight down and break your bones, boy. It took us about a good 15 minutes just to get to the bottom, and I was probably going to take it around twice that just trying to get back up with the packs on. I wasn't even looking up, man. I was too scared that if I did, I'd lose my foot and fall. I just kept going up and up, and I knew I was getting closer to the top, because I heard Sergeant Diaz's voice getting louder and louder. We was about three feet away, and I was able to get to the top first. Then I heard Jackson yelling for help. I think I twisted my ankle, man. Help, please, man. That's all I heard, and I saw that Diaz was standing by the edge looking down. 
He was just waiting for Jackson to get up and before he even started screaming loud at him. Stop playing around, Jackson. You are two freaking seconds away from me coming down there and pushing you down myself. But Jackson just kept screaming louder and Diaz finally got fed up so he crouched down and tried to reach for Jackson. But before he could grab him, Jackson slipped and started falling down real fast. Then all I heard was just this, this gut-wrenching thump and nothing else. No more screaming, not even a, a little whimper, man. Just, just quiet. He did, man. You let him fall. I screamed at Diaz. He ain't even look at me. You know, then he just started walking away and he walked back towards me and said, don't say a word. Not a single freaking word, you understand me? Now stay here. I just nodded and stormed up out of there. Then like a minute later, he came back with the other drill sergeants. One of them ordered me to get back in formation with the rest of the platoon. I don't remember much of what happened. All I remember was that they cut the hike short and we were brought back to our quarters. We were told to stay put and we didn't hear any word until the next day. They said training was going to continue despite the tragic accident that happened to recruit Jackson. Man, that wasn't no accident, man. Diaz let him fall to his death. I want to say some man for some reason or another, man. I ain't say nothing. It's like a part of me was actually happy to see that Jackson was finally gone. I know it's messed up, but that's how I felt about the kid. When I started remembering just how annoying he was. And it wasn't like anything was gonna happen, even if I did snitch on Diaz. We never did see him again after the hike, and just a week later, a new drill sergeant took his place just like that. Like I said, Army don't play, boy. I wasn't even waiting the whole time to get called up for questioning on what I saw the day Jackson died. You know, but nobody did. It's like Sergeant Diaz left, so did all the questions about Jackson leave too? So I just let it go. They weren't about to mess with the whole thing anymore than I so wasn't finna mess with it. They moved on, so you know, so will I. After that, the last few weeks of boot camp flew by like a breeze, boy, I'm talking about. Next thing I knew, I was graduating boot camp. It was finally over. Basic training was done and I was officially a soldier. I found out I was gonna be fulfilling the rest of my contract on a base in Hawaii. <laughs> I was excited like, man, boy, I was so happy. I already done left the hood behind, man. I don't be living on a sunny island too. Life is good, man. But apparently, life was too good. It ain't take long after I got settled into my barracks that, you know, it started happening. I started seeing Jackson. And I'm not talking about a trick of the eye or the way the light reflects. I ain't talking about memories or flashbacks either. Nah, man, I'm talking about it was really Jackson, he was really showing himself to me. You know, it started off slow, just barely noticeable. I'd be busy working, then I suddenly see a glimpse of him out the corner of my eye. Then I look and he wasn't there no more. Then over time, he became just more and more visible. You know, I started seeing him at formation, standing in my spot. Then there'd be these days he, you know, he show up running right beside me during our morning runs, and man, he scared a Jesus up out of me, man. I trip and fall flat on my face, which made everybody laugh, you know, everybody except Jackson. 
he was just staring there, staring at me with his cold, dead, unmoving eyes, man. Then he just disappeared again. I was finally starting to get used to seeing Jackson until he started taking it to the next level. It was Thanksgiving weekend and everybody went home for the holidays. I was all alone in my room and the barracks was basically empty and there was like only 10 or 12 of us there. I ain't taking any leave because, you know, it wasn't like my mom and pop were going to be cooking up a turkey. And at least on base, I actually had a decent bed and a TV. And since there was nothing to do, really, and me and the other guys, you know, we got together and drank. And we drank till like 3 in the morning, and that's when everybody just, just clocked on out. There was a bunch of wussies, man. I was still good, man, but I said, you know, screw it, whatever, man. I went back to my room and went straight for my bed and fell straight to sleep. It probably wasn't even a whole five minutes when I heard somebody tapping on my window. I figured one of the guys woke up and wanted to go another round, but I was already sleepy, man. I wasn't about to get my lazy butt up, man, so I just laid there, and the tapping just kept coming, though. It got so annoying, I grabbed the remote that was on the nightstand and chucked it at the window, man. It must have worked, because the tapping finally stopped. I was about to go, you know, back to sleep when I felt something hit the back of my head. Man, I sat straight up and saw the remote, you know, just right beside me. Man, I got up so angry, I swore I was going to punch a hole in the fool that did this, man. I'm going to knock his dang teeth out, man. And he was right there. Jackson, right in front of me. And I'm talking like five inches away from my own face, man. I wanted to swing at him or at least scream or something, but I couldn't move, man. I was staring straight into his eyes, man. They were white as snow and his skin was pale. Then he started moving his mouth, but there was no sound coming out. But I could tell he was only saying one word over and over again. But my drink and scared butt, man, I couldn't make out what he was saying. But he kept saying it. And he started saying it faster and faster. And just then, I finally started to hear something. But it wasn't words. It was, a, it was screeching, like loud, ear bleeding, screeching, man. It hurt so bad I fell to my knees and I guess I must have passed out because the next thing I knew I was at the emergency room on base. Doctor told me I was lucky the other guys found me when they did. He said they found me on the floor shaking real bad and foam coming out of my mouth. The doctor closed the door and sat down beside me. Look, I don't know what your reasons were, but I, I need you to tell me why you did it. And I need you to be honest with me. I would like to help you save your career. And maybe even your life if I can, the doctor said. I looked at him like he was talking crazy, man. I asked him, what is you talking about? Article 134, I would assume you know what that is. What? I said back. He said, look. I know you're probably going through a lot right now, but this isn't a way out. Article 134 is a serious matter, and the last thing you want to happen is for you to be dishonorably discharged or even get jail time. Now I was really starting to get PO'd, man. And I was starting to shout and started raising my voice too, man. I was going back and forth, and then he finally stood up and yelled at me. Why did you try to commit suicide, soldier? Why are you trying to kill yourself? You know what, kid? I tried to help, but if you want to get bent over and railed hard by the Uniform Code of Military Conduct Justice, then you go right ahead. The Army would love to do so. Now I was really confused. Now, suicide? Me? <laughs> well, I love myself too much. What is he talking about? I told him, man, me and the other guys were having a drink. And I went back to the room and then, 
No. The other guys were just coming back from PX, about to start drinking. Deciding to pass by your room and tag you alone, and they found you laying on the ground instead. Dying, he said. You drank all right. You drank a whole bottle of toilet bowl cleaner, and now you're here. Toilet bowl cleaner? What the? Why would I drink toilet bowl cleaner? How could I even drink toilet bowl cleaner without throwing up? <laughs> you know, who, 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 I can't do that. You know, I was going to say something else, but the doctor walked out the room and just left me alone. Man, what the heck is going on? From living in the hood to being in the military, I always thought I was going to go down because of a bullet through the head or something. I never thought I'd get taken down by some dang toilet bowl cleaner. The next day, I was discharged out of the hospital and two MPs, a military police, military popo, uh, you know, we call them M12 now. They came and um, put me, they were waiting for me at the entrance, and they put me in handcuffs and read me my rights, which in the military ain't a whole lot. Because of my apparent suicide attempt, I was charged with Article 134, self-injury without intent to avoid service. What that basically means is that I'm getting punished for trying to kill myself. I know that sounds crazy and stupid, but you gotta understand, once you sign that dotted line, Uncle Sam own you, show. Once I stepped in boot camp, I was officially government property. An attempted at suicide is considered damaging government property, and that is a big no-no. So I was demoted to the rank of private, had my pay taken, and I was sentenced to three years in jail and had a dishonorable discharge waiting for me after I do my time. I had officially hit rock bottom again. I had my life together. Everything was going good, but some way, somehow, I got screwed over by some punk ghosts who made me drink toilet bowl cleaner. And for some reason, I don't know, Jackson never even showed himself, you know, the entire time I was in jail. Shoot, I guess even ghosts need visitor passes to get up in here. But somebody else did show up, though. Another familiar face. A face I thought I'd never see again. Y'all know who. Diaz. He came to visit me during my last few months in the brig. Apparently, he got wind of what happened and decided to come by and talk. And we did. I tell you, man, seeing this guy talking normal and not screaming and cursing after each word was just weird. I guess I never got around to realizing him and the other drill sergeants back in boot camp were just humans too. Just doing their jobs and all. We small talked for a bit and I find out he wasn't kicked out the army, army like we all thought. Turns out he left on his own because of what happened at Jackson. He requested for a change of duty station and ended up here in Hawaii where he served the remainder of his contract. I asked him why he never contested the uh, official cause of Jackson's death, why he never manned up and admitted it was his fault. He looked at me like I was high or something and bust out laughing. <laughs> You're choking, right? Jesus, Johnson. I guess you had a worse brain fog than I thought. What are you saying, Sergeant? I asked. He shook his head and he leaned in closer. Then he told me everything. Everything I should know, but somehow don't. Have you ever heard that when you go through an event that's so traumatic, your brain start forgetting stuff for you? Like your own body is trying to prevent you from going insane? They say it's a defense mechanism, apparently from the looks of it, that's what my brain did. That's what I did. I forgot everything. Erased all of it from my memory and created something different. A fake memory, a lie. 
I know that the few parts of this story sound familiar, very familiar. I know you in pain. You all are, but mostly you. I finally understand what this is. It's my apology letter. Or at least the closest it would get to being one. I wanted to show you why I did what I did. I wanted to share what I felt and my perspective of things that happened. I know it won't bring him back, but but maybe, just maybe, it can give him and you some closure, even just a little bit. I'm sorry, man. I really am. I was just jealous, just really jealous. Jackson had everything going for him. He was a kid from the hood, just like me. But he wasn't like me. No, he was a straight shooter. He was a good kid. He fought against the hood life. Never joined the gang. Never got in trouble. Except for that time he was beat up by a couple of gangbangers who wouldn't take no for an answer. Then he was given a chance to get the heck up out the hood when the army came knocking. He made y'all proud. He was going to be a soldier. Your brave little boy was going to be the best he could. He was going to be all he could be. But then I came along. A grumpy gangbanger from the hood. You see, I never had that kind of mentality Jackson did. I fell for the trap of the trap. The gang life, the street life, it was about, you know, I was about to go to jail until the judge told me I could join the army instead and be a productive member of society. So I did. It was finna be a breeze anyway, right? Until I met your son, Jackson. His optimism and never die attitude, it ticked me off, man. Because I could, you know, I could never be like that because I could never be brave as him. So that day during the hike when he was screaming for help, I pushed him off. It was me. It was never Diaz. My brain just chose to cover up, you know, cover my own butt. I tried to blame it on him. Diaz didn't tell me to shut up because he was afraid he'd lose his job. No, he told me to shut up so I wouldn't get in trouble. He was able to convince the higher-ups that what happened to Jackson was a training accident. And the reason he left, it wasn't because, you know, he couldn't keep the, you know, keep the lie. It was because he kept seeing me every day. Turns out he used to be a gangbanger himself when he was younger. Then the army took him in and changed his life for the better. And he was hoping that, you know, I was going to do the same and redeem myself. But I didn't. I wasted the opportunity. I wasted a third chance at a better life. The chance that Diaz gave me. I know for a fact Jackson wouldn't have wasted it. But I ain't Jackson, though. Even if I did try to pretend to be like him. So I could cope with my own failures. I'd never be like him. And looking back. I know what Jackson kept saying over and over again. During the first time I attempted suicide. You. 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 He was right. It was me. It is me. The one responsible for taking away everything from him and from you. I got out of the hood, but now I'm back in it. I ruined my shot all because I was jealous. I know you will never forgive me. But I figured you deserve to know the truth. 
I'm so sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. I am for real. I never meant to make your daughter cry. And I apologize a trillion times. Remember when I said that bullet to the head would be what probably took me out. Do you remember? Chilling tales for dark nights.